Welcome to Politics at the Crossroads, the podcast that sits at the intersection of politics and Christian faith. In our fourth episode, I sat down to speak with Jonathan Aitken, former Conservative MP and Cabinet member before he was dramatically sentenced to seven months at Belmarsh Prison in 1999 for perjury. Following his conversion to Christianity, Jonathan trained for ministry in the Church of England and now serves as non-stipendary priest at St. Matthew's Westminster in London and as prison chaplain at Pentonville Prison. We had a delightful conversation about prison rehabilitation, the power of forgiveness in a culture that is losing the will to forgive, about his Anglo-Catholic evangelical faith, and about the need for Christians to be small p political in their involvement in public life. I really hope that you enjoy the conversation. Great. Um, So yeah, the first question that I have for you, Jonathan, is looking at uh, where you sit um, politically uh, and theologically. Um, I wonder if you don't mind uh, for listeners, watchers, just painting a picture of, of where you stand Politically, theologically, and and perhaps more interestingly, how you how you got there. Well, I am perhaps known to more people as a politician, although I've long since been compulsorily retired from that arena, than I am for being a priest. Um, but it's not really all that relevant to this conversation, although perhaps interesting, because <clears throat> the political traditions that I used to uh, um, uphold during my 24 years in the House of Commons, which included a spell as government minister. Um, I've really not exactly um, abdicated from those traditions, but I really don't think about them at all. Um, I have moved to, in effect, uh, being non-political. I'm certainly not any party political anymore. I'm interested in politics. Um, uh, How could I not be after spending uh, most of my adult life in politics? But I don't have a passionate commitment to any uh, known political party or tradition. Um, And I think this is just because of life's journey. Um, I was really last a practicing politician uh, in the uh, 1997, so uh, I fought and lost that election uh, under the Conservative banner. And of course, I um, have then been on a momentous personal and spiritual journey. Um, and politics doesn't really come into that much, except perhaps politics with a small p. Um, I'm interested, of course. Um, I also rather believe in. A remark once made by Edmund Burke, uh, who said, whenever anyone says, what does the state matter to me, the state may be given up as lost. And so I think it's your duty, whether you're an ordinary citizen or a priest, to take an interest in affairs of state. So I often ask myself, well, how is the government doing? But not how how is the Conservative government doing, or how is the Labour government doing, or just really what is, how is the state being governed? Um, and of course I have frequent views on, um, I didn't express them to anybody much more except my wife, but um, I still uh, hold them and, and hold a great interest. And I'm, um, I suppose the tradition that I come from was uh, what might be called liberal conservatism Um, and I haven't sort of changed massively in my private thoughts. I haven't become a Marxist or a member of New Labour, something like that, Uh, but I don't think of myself anymore as a Conservative Party uh, supporter and I would be quite willing to vote for any other political party even though it might mean jettisoning the habits of a lifetime, but I'd be open to um, uh, any other way of political thought. Um, Of course, my shift to being uh, no longer party political has been 
I suppose to some extent uh, affected by my own experiences in the last 20 years. And they included all kinds of rather dramatic experiences on a personal journey. I sometimes say I went through in a very short period from being uh, a cabinet minister and indeed tipped as a future prime minister. That's not a great accolade, by the way. You could fill Wimbledon Stadium by the number of people who have been unsuccessful and wrongly tipped to being future prime minister. But still, uh, it, just to have the label stuck on you, however foolishly and briefly, just indicates that once upon a time, I, I was very involved, very interested. But uh, the experiences that I went through included, I mean, a dramatic fall from grace. Um, I went through what I sometimes called uh, defeat, disgrace, divorce, bankruptcy, and jail. And that's a pretty good royal flush of crises by anybody's standards. So I know the sort of dark side of dark valleys. Um, I also, of course, enlarged my social circle enormously as a result of uh, being a prisoner, uh, which was extremely interested and enriching. Um, and so much so that um, long before I ever thought of becoming ordained, I always said, well, I've seen something in a side of life very few people do see what prison is about, what um, uh, <clears throat> prison reform needs to be, what offender management needs to be, what the rehabilitation of offenders needs to be. And that, of course, was something I knew, I'm sorry to say, very, very little about uh, until I went through the um, mill of the criminal justice system as a prisoner. <clears throat> um, and those experiences um, have certainly changed my attitudes. I don't think they've changed particularly my political lo loyalties, uh, but I have much more understanding of and sympathy for what might be called the um, uh, underdogs of society. Uh, I was very surprised as a fellow prisoner to find out when I wrote letters to my fellow prisoners, in large numbers, often on the most intimate subjects imaginable, how many of them had had such an appallingly uh, deprived start in life. Um, something like 40% of them had spent their childhoods or adolescence in care. Mm -hmm. Many of them didn't even know who their fathers were. Mm -hmm. And if you've uh, grown up with nobody much saying, son, I love you, well done, but instead of being in sort of institutional care, of course, you have a very different uh, and deprived attitude and experience of life. Uh, and then in terms of education, I was astounded to discover as a prisoner that roughly a third of my fellow prisoners could not read or write to an adequate standard. Um, how do I know that? Because we had a, every prisoner has a test when they come into, and it's a pretty basic literacy and numeracy test. I think the first question on my prison examination was the fat cat sat on the M blank T, fill in the blank. Um, well, um, I, I passed, but um, two thirds, of, one third of my fellow prisoners did not pass. Right. And that says all kinds of things about our society. Mm. So my attitudes to solving some of the problems uh, that society as a whole, and particularly that section of society faces, uh, is much more involved, much more interested, and it's one of the reasons uh, why, slightly to my surprise, I'm now an ordained priest and prison chaplain. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, well, that's a brief summary of, of my political changes. Um, uh, theologically, or, or in terms of churchmanship, um, I'm a rather oddball. Um, I uh, grew up, I suppose, in what might be called loosely middle church. Um, uh, I was lucky I went to good schools with an Anglican tradition, um, but it was sort of a middle tradition, neither evangelical nor Anglo-Catholic. Um, almost by chance, um, after I came out of prison, I went to the one institution in Britain, which I like to joke had worse food, worse plumbing and more uncomfortable beds than a prison. And that was 
an Anglican theological college at Oxford, Wycliffe Hall. And I spent two wonderful years there, um, of course, getting steeped in the evangelical tradition mm -hmm. and with wonderful tutors and scholars who were um, educating me. Uh, on the whole, I loved Wycliffe and benefited enormously from it. But if I have a little grumble about Wycliffe, I would say its uh, interest in the Anglo-Catholic tradition was very low indeed. Mm. Uh, for example, there were in the Wycliffe Library shelves upon shelves of books about the Reformation. Um, there were about three books about the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation out of a hundred, I would say. And that perhaps uh, is an indication of uh, how evangelical libraries even can be quite narrow. Um, and I noticed this narrowness because all the time I was at Wycliffe, despite the excellence of the teaching and the very high quality of the evangelical preaching and teaching, I was myself quietly sort of drawn, and I don't quite know why, to the Catholic spiritual tradition. I had a wonderful spiritual director who was rather famous called Father Gerard Hughes. He wrote a great book called God of Surprises. He was a Jesuit uh, with a mind like a steel trap in terms of uh, Catholic theology. Uh, and um, I really just off my own bat have uh, increasingly read um, uh, Catholic theology, Anglo-Catholic spiritual books, and so on, um, without neglecting um, uh, the um, evangelical writers. As it happens, perhaps I can indicate the breadth of my mongrel attitudes to uh, these two faiths uh, here in Lent, and I'm really reading two books simultaneously. Right. Uh, one is a great evangelical classic, which I had read before, but it's called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And the other is a series of lectures by Evelyn Underhill, right. who would be regarded, I think, as a uh, Catholic tradition mystic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love both of them. And so what is my tradition? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think of myself when pressed against the wall and asked by someone like yourself, what is your tradition? Mm -hmm. I would say, baffling everybody, I think I'm an evangelical Anglo-Catholic. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I think there are great um, um, qualities and, and in, in both traditions, and they should use each other's resources more than they do. Mm -hmm. um, I actually serve as a um, priest in two places, um, in prisons, where actually there isn't any tradition at all. Um, or anything goes, but if there is a tradition, it's um, sort of on the whole side, the um, black church evangelical. Mm. Uh, they, they are the best singers and says of our men's or man, the preacher's right um, in, the, um, in the congregation. Um, and uh, I actually am a uh, assistant minister in an Anglo-Catholic church called St. Matthew's Westminster, which I sometimes joke is so high that if the Pope dropped in on one of our Sunday masses, he might be rather embarrassed by the <laughs> loftiness of the high church spirituality of the Catholic tradition. Right. So um, I am, as I say, a bit of a mongrel, but mm. I'm a very happy uh, mongrel. <laughs> but I uh, really do love and admire both traditions. Mm. I think they can benefit much more than they do from each other. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's um, absolutely fascinating. And um, I find it interesting that, um, I suppose, on the uh, political side, that there's a growing sense that you've, as I understand it, become more interested in the, in the deeper values that sort of transcend party political allegiance. Oh, yes. Um, that's, yeah. I think that's so interesting. And, and, and then theologically, um, that, that sense of, of wanting to appreciate the, the, the breadth and, um, that's there in the Anglican, Anglican tradition. I wonder if we could just move on to look at, and this is something you've, you've touched on, something that's close to your own heart, which is, is prison reform, an area of work that, that you've engaged with a lot. And 
I know as we were scheduling this interview that you mentioned, uh, you know, you had weekly visits, perhaps even more frequently to Pentonville prison. And as you alluded to, as you mentioned, spending seven months at, at Belmarsh. Um, and uh, I really liked your article and in, in, in Unheard about uh, the habits that you developed and how those can be applied to, to lockdown. Um, you've, you know, you've engaged with um, Prison Fellowship, you're a director of that, and um, also led on reports um, such as the Centre for Social Justice's Locked Up Potential. I'd just love to hear more of your reflections on, on prisons and prison reform. Um, um, I suppose my, my basic question here is, you know, what do you think prisons are for? Um, how is a society, how is Christian, should we be thinking about prisons uh, and how should they be best set up? Well, on your first question, what are prisons for? Um, I think there are three sensible purposes. We don't give sufficient weight to some of those traditions, uh, but one is the protection of the public. And I think I know because I, while I was in prison, uh, and in day-to-day -day life as a chaplain, I do meet some extremely dangerous criminals with a history of violence and sexual um, uh, violence who do need to be in a prison uh, in order to the people, to, the public to be protected from. So that's one appeal, uh, purpose of prison. Second purpose of prison, um, I think, there are situations in which the state can and does and should punish the guilty. And I think that prison is not always the right punishment of any means, but sometimes it is. Uh, and um, it's a, not that we don't apply punishments as thoughtfully and as carefully and as a targeted way as we should. We almost certainly send too many people to prison, but nonetheless, I do think the punishment of the guilty in circumstances uh, does require a prison sentence. Uh, the third area, which is the weakest area, is that a purpose of prison should be the rehabilitation of offenders. Uh, leaving out a whole huge issue and arena of sentencing policy. Uh, if anyone is sentenced to prison, I think a part of that sentence should be aimed at rehabilitating him or her uh, and encouraging him to take uh, new courses, new ways of life, which will mean that they don't come back to prison and um, you know, lead a different kind of life. Uh, here, I'm afraid prison is a total failure. Um, uh, the statistics in the prison world are extremely unreliable, but this one is as reliable as any, roughly speaking out of every 10 prisoners who are released from prison, seven are reconvicted and back in prison within two years. What a rate of failure. Um, and um, the um, uh, explanations for that are many and varied. Um, a great many of them are related to drug addiction and drug abuse, uh, but our health society is not really tackling uh, rehabilitation and the prevention of reoffending. So, completely inadequate um, effort by society. Um, the people who are doing it best are not the state, but you are find some good charities, very often localized charities, which actually do rehabilitation remarkably well. And it's very difficult because uh, rehabilitating offenders uh, is not a kind of uh, one size fits all mass production policy effort. It's a bespoke tailoring effort. Most offenders are individually very different from other uh, offenders and to mentor them, to get them back on the road of a law abiding life is difficult, um, but it is done all the time. And um, I am, for example, very proud to be uh, the founding president of a charity up in Yorkshire called Tempus Novo. It began out of a conversation between myself and a couple of uh, 
pretty blunt speaking Yorkshire prison officers who, like quite a few prison officers, have a yearning to rehabilitate rather than to be turnkeys. And we had some conversations and we got it going. And uh, it's been going now 10 years. I think I'm right in saying that last year, uh, Tampa Snowbo, on still very modest budget, uh, managed to uh, take 350 prisoners off the wings in various Yorkshire uh, prisons and get them into jobs while mentoring and encouraging them with a very low failure rate of people coming back into crime and abandoning those jobs. And so, and there are other fine charities which do the rehabilitation both a practical way and also in a moral way extremely well. But there are tiny little islands in a sea of basic hopelessness on the rehabilitation policy front. Um, so my heart is uh, in rehabilitation. Uh, but looking at our prisons, um, I have a somewhat um, more upbeat view and positive view than most people do. Um, I, I am very honored to be a chaplain at Pendleville, which on the surface is one of the worst prisons in London. Why do I say it's worst? Well, the infrastructure is Dickensian, walls are crumbling, there are rodents and cockroaches around in uncomfortably large numbers. Uh, the whole place is a physical shambles. On the other hand, um, and we have a lot of very young prisoners, gangs, because we're a big remand prison. 60% of our prisoners are on remand after having committed quite serious gangland crimes like stabbings and so on. Um, but nevertheless, Penville has some very good officers, um, very good probation officers, and we don't do badly. And first of all, preserving a safe environment for them all to live together in. Uh, secondly, to um, have quite a good atmosphere. Um, and thirdly, to uh, do something about um, giving them some hope in various areas. Uh, now it's, uh, and for example, Pentonville has done astonishingly well throughout the pandemic. Um, much better, I think, than any other prison in Britain. That's interesting. Um, I was going to ask you about that, about the effects of the lockdown and pandemic. Well, the pandemic in this case. Well, um, Pentonville, when the pandemic began, uh, was in a state of total panic because two rather good officers died of COVID in the first week of April. Oh. And that sent shock raves surging through the um, prison. Uh, and there was a certain amount of panic. Um, an overreaction. I mean, we, for example, created a morgue complete with body bags. We, um, over a third of the staff went off sick. Um, some of them because they were sick, a lot of them because they were uh, in a perhaps overreacting state of panic. Um, but uh, thanks to good governance and very good young officers, actually got the pandemic. Uh, under control, it'd be rather technical to tell you in detail, but uh, we, we did an awful lot of um, uh, social distancing, keeping men in cells much longer than you would normally do. And surprisingly, the prisoners themselves were supportive of that. Usually when you keep men banged up for 23 hours a day, you have trouble. Uh, not in this lockdown, partly because we explained it all to them so well, I think. and. Um, partly because prisoners are people. They could read, watch the television, they could see how dangerous the, the, the situation was, how particularly dangerous it was in an um, overcrowded prison. And by some great officer work and teamwork, we actually worked out a most complicated system for um, keeping people separated, separated and quarantined and moving in separate bubbles. And the result was that Pantadour had almost the lowest and still has the lowest COVID uh, internal infection rates. Um, uh, some prisons like um, Granby in Nottinghamshire and Brixton in London still have um, outbreaks of 
sort of two, three, four hundred prisoners uh, infected by COVID. Pentonville, I think I'm right saying the figure right now, is about 20. And we've had no new cases in prison for something like uh, two or three months. Great achievement. Um, and the team spirit among prisoners and um, officers to achieve this has been pretty impressive. Mm. And I tell you all this to say that prisons are not totally bad news. Uh, there is good news sometimes coming out of a prison, um, but there are plenty of bad news as well. For example, uh, how do you give young prisoners who are on remand awaiting court hearings hope uh, when their time on remand is now extending into the wild blue yonder uh, thanks to the pressures on courts. Uh, this time last year, a prisoner arrested for, let's say, a street gang crime offence spent two or three months waiting to come to court if they were remanded in custody. Now, the waiting time is something like 20 months, going to over 24 months in many cases. And so that causes far more gloom uh, than uh, the COVID crisis does. Uh, so there are big problems always in prisons. But I love being a prison chaplain because the pastoral work is very intense. Uh, you are all the time helping people, um, um, preaching the gospel to people, um, <coughs> counseling people, sometimes preventing suicides or self-harmers. And it's a daily challenge of some magnitude, I often come away exhausted from a day in the prison. But um, I do feel that I have served God and have served the prisoners uh, and the staff by just being there as a chaplain. It's a great calling. Mm. Do you think that, um, how does your sort of Christian faith and your own story play into your passion for, for prison reform and an interest in, in working with those in prison? Well, there's no doubt that um, working in prisons is totally in accordance with the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the Bible. The uh, sheep and the goats parable includes the most much neglected line when Jesus in effect says to what I suspect was a rather comfortable audience, um, where were you when I was in prison? <coughs> and um, uh, and the answer is in the parable was, well, you weren't anywhere because you didn't recognize that mm. I was one of the least of those your brethren you did not visit. <clears throat> but there are other great passages. I mean, there's a verse in Hebrews that says, um, remember your fellow prisoners as if you were in prison yourself, and so on. So the Christian teachings are um, very, very encouraging to anyone who does prison ministry. Um, in terms of applying it, um, uh, I uh, find um, working with the least of these, my brethren, um, often a rather inspirational challenge. Um, there are people uh, from all sorts and conditions of backgrounds, <clears throat> and um, I am, as most prison chapters are, completely non judgmental. I find myself dealing every day with people who have committed appalling crimes of physical and sexual violence or murders and so on. Uh, but my job and the chaplain's job is to reach out to them and try and lead them to, towards uh, God's teachings, God's example, and to help them in that journey. Uh, and um, it's a challenge. And it's a strength, I find, um, to be able to say to uh, incredulous looks, I used to be a prisoner, you know, and they <laughs> stared at me ridiculous, you're far too posh, sitting around <laughs> your dog collar and you're eating an Oxford accent. Uh, but actually, it doesn't take long to drop a few names of wings and to them to know I'm an authentic ex-prisoner. And that makes them listen uh, much more careful than they would otherwise. And that's uh, just my trump card, which I enjoy playing. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that would yeah, lead to good identification and um, 
and trust, wouldn't it? Yeah, yours is really a story of of great reversals, um, as you just mentioned there, and we're describing. And and I was listening to one of your talks recently, which I thought had a great title: uh, "From Power to Prison and Then to Peace." Oh, really? <laughs> and, oh that's true. Uh, yes. Um, so within your own personal story, clearly you lay great emphasis on um, on God's grace and on forgiveness and and redemption, and that, that out of the mess of our lives, uh, God Absolutely. can bring an unexpected and undeserved good. I just wonder if, sort of zooming out slightly and looking at that broader value of forgiveness, um, it seems to me that we're kind of increasingly, as a society, moving away from that as a value of forgiveness, as you talked about um, uh, judgment. and. This plays out in all sorts of ways, um, I suppose, in, in um, cancel culture and and the like, and um, increasing echo chambers that we see in society and uh, public online denunciations and so on. Um, I just wondered, first of all, would you agree with that statement that we're moving away from forgiveness as a value and perhaps losing the will to forgive? And then secondly, if you do agree with that, what do you see as the kind of constructive solution or answer to, to, to that state of affairs? Well, I, I do agree, I'm afraid, with a lot of what you've said, <clears throat> although uh, it's very often the lack of forgiveness and the judgmentalism, which is real. I mean, social media is um, viciously condemnatory of, of um, things which people have often done themselves. Um, and um, But nevertheless, you're right that um, I think our society seems to be publicly at least moving in the direction of uh, more and more non-forgiveness more and more judgmentalism more and more condemnation <clears throat> and yet there's something rather puzzling in the middle of it all but when you or even in gallup polls but certainly in the middle of it all individually as opposed to corporately publicly nationally regionally individually I find that people actually are quite thoughtful about being forgiving. There are some who are absolutely not. Uh, but uh, and why do I say this? Well, um, if you, for example, first of all, look at Gallup polls, most people tend to agree that um, we should give second chances to those who are offended, including those coming out of prison. If you say, do you believe people should have a second chance? Oh, yes, I do. I think I do. Uh, and so it's one area. Another area is, um, if you ask them, do you think we should give fewer people prison sentences and more people non-custodial sentences? And again, there is a growing uh, tendency to say yes, as a galloper, although with some justification, a lot of people think some of the non-custodial sentences are just too soft. I mean, and you don't even have to turn up to where they're supposed to on probation and things like that. Um, but um, <clears throat> so I, I think it's a more complex picture than it looks. Uh, but I mean, is that surprising individually? Um, I mean, the Christian faith is a calling of individuals. Um, uh, it, it is, you know, Jesus speaking to individual hearts and changing them. Um, of course, he spoke to big audiences as well. But I think in the end, it's how we individually respond to Christ's teachings. And the wonderfully best feature of the Christian faith is, of course, the willingness to forgive, the teachings to forgive. And I think people are willing to hear that message and uh, put it into practice. But if you look in the big picture, you hear a lot of noise to the contrary. And that's the paradox. Mm. Perhaps we, uh, <laughs> as we um, sort of operate in big groups, we lose that that value or that um, that sort of virtue of forgiveness. That's really interesting. Interesting reflection. I'm just staying on this theme, but um, moving in a slightly different direction with it. I just noticed that um, in in your own published work. Um, particularly in your biographies, you've looked at figures, uh, both politicians and sort of people, uh, church leaders, um, who have had uh, similar kind of rags to riches 
stories or, or, or to some extent um <laughs> you've you've looked at um for instance uh richard nixon um and john newton i just wondered uh was there part of your own kind of story that interested you in looking at them or something else that that drew you to to writing about say john uh newton or richard nixon well, when I wrote about Nixon, <clears throat> needless to say, I had not the faintest idea that I was going to have a full embrace myself. And I that was before. was okay. fascinated by the complexity of Nixon's character. And um, I think uh, it's the book of mine which perhaps will last the longest because Nixon was so difficult to get under the skin of and to get to understand. And um, and his fall from grace was uh, terrible and tragic, but he was actually an outstanding foreign policy president and a very interesting and often good man. Uh, and it, it, the complexity of Richard Nixon would take me several hours to attempt to explain, but um, I, I still remind, remain on the stock exchange of history a strong buyer of Nixon shares. Um, he will be regarded a century or so from now in much better light than he is today for a wide variety of reasons, including his goodness of character, which surprises most people. He was also quite a thoughtful theological mind. Um, it was interesting, he wrote some very good stuff as a very young man, a student on theology. Uh, you might say it was a little bit wacky, some of it, but nevertheless, was he interested uh, in exploring God, you know, and a, a teenage essay who also at the university en ends up with the extraordinary conclusion, probably the mission of my life to model myself on the teachings of Jesus Christ. Extraordinary thing for him to say, um, and surprises everybody, but there it is uh, in writing. Um, John Newton, I think I did write about uh, at a time when I myself had got into trouble. Um, <clears throat> I can't touch the hem of John Newton's garment, either as a sinner or, or as a priest. I mean, Newton was, uh, in his youth, a seriously bad man in the sense that he um, rebelled against everything. Uh, he was imprisoned. He was flogged by the Royal Navy for desertion. Uh, he was a slave trader. He was... Uh, sexually abused the slaves on board his ships and things like that. Um, uh, but he uh, again was touched by the grace of God. He changed and he became one of the most um, superb uh, writers and expanders of the Christian gospel of anybody of his age or perhaps for all time. And I think about him a lot. Um, and at the time I think of him most often, uh, occasionally people are kind enough to say to me after I've given a talk or preached some words some nice compliment and I always keep in mind uh, the story of John Newton coming down the steps of his pulpit which packed church uh, in his uh, home church of St Mary Woolnoth in London and some excitable parishioner rushed up and said oh Mr Newton that was a brilliant sermon and Newton said Thank you, sir. The devil told me that himself a few seconds ago. <laughs> a reminder that preaching is full of temptations and the glory goes to God, not yourself. Are there other uh, particular uh, Christians in particular that uh, who committed to political life or public service that um, if not you'd looked up to that you have, that have inspired you in your faith? Well, um, yes, but on the whole, no one's heard of them. Um, I had a godfather called Selwyn Lloyd, who was Foreign Secretary, Chancellor Exchequer, Speaker of the House of Commons. He had a quiet Methodist faith, which certainly made a great impact on me. Sir Alec Douglas Hume, who was a Prime Minister here, um, for a rather short period in the 1960s, was an evangelical Christian. Uh, there's a nice story about him. Um, actually, I, I witnessed the story because I was a young 
aid and speechwriter to him. And we were up in the Blackpool party conference. And it was sort of still rather a secret who was evangelical, who wasn't in those days. And suddenly uh, a lady of exuberant evangelical tendency saw uh, the Prime Minister and rushed up to him and said, Sir Alex, Sir Alex, I hear you've been saved. Is it true you've been saved? Alex, I assume, um, looked as they'd been a rabbit caught in the glare of headlights and sort of scuttled away. But she pursued him and said, Sir, Sir Alex, is it true? Have you been saved? He then, rather nervously, begging her over, said, in a quiet voice, Yes, madam, I, I, not like it is true. I, I believe I have been saved by the grace of God. She said, Why are you not proclaiming it from the house tops? Why are you not uh, letting everyone know? He said, Madam, in my case, it was such a close run thing. I think it's better to keep quiet about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. Um, yeah. But um, I mean, I admire Jimmy Carter yeah. <clears throat> in the United States. I think too many American politicians wear their spiritual hearts on their sleeve. But that's uh, my uh, Anglican reticence, which prefers it that way. But um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of good people in politics who do have quiet faiths and one or two of them very much inspired me. Someone called Michael Allison, who was a church warden of Holy Trinity Brompton and a contemporary of mine in the House of Commons, uh, was a very, very fine Christian leader to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude. And I could go on naming names for some time, but they are around. Mm. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's really interesting and in hearing about some of the, as you say, the those who uh, were perhaps not uh, as exuberant, but nevertheless had a had a powerful impact on you. I wonder if um, you could change the tack just slightly and move to um, the, a topic that we sort of touched on, um, which is is kind of uh, related to um, clergy and laity, and of course, um, now that now that you're ordained, I'd be interested to hear. Your, your perspective on this, but there's been there have been some interesting surveys lately showing us that there's a bit of a, a, a divide uh, in terms of um, cultural identity or uh, cultural values, perhaps, between laity and the clergy. Perhaps um, this can be overstated, but the data nevertheless show that there is something of a disparity so in 2019, a survey from that year showed that Church of England parishioners, 58% uh, of them voted for the Conservative Party in 2017. And then a survey from just a month or so ago showed that only 6% of Anglican clergy voted Conservative in the most recent election in 2019. Of course, this, this point isn't party political in the sense that <laughs> why aren't... Um, more clergy <clears throat> conservative or something like that. It's just to, to show that there's something perhaps of a disparity in values. I just wondered, as someone who can't really hide from perhaps um, the fact that you were a conservative MP before, although as you've described, there, there's, there's been a journey there. I just wonder what you make of this disconnect. Is this something that concerns you or worries you, to, you at all? Well, first of all, I couldn't care less about this subject, but as you're tempting me onto the ground of it, um, there was an old saying in the, um, uh, the previous century, I think it was Disraeli or something that cracked a joke saying, uh, <clears throat> the Tory party, uh, sorry, the Church of England is the Tory party at prayer. Mm. Now, I think that would not be true today. Um, the um, uh, Church of England, I think is a very broad church politically. Um, like Queen Elizabeth I, I do not wish to make any windows into people's souls of a political nature. So I simply couldn't care less about what anybody's political e allegiance might be. Whenever they tell me, um, I'm interested, but it, it isn't of any um, relevance. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Clergy, uh, are not a whole lot of dangerous lefties. Um, they are, in my view, on the whole, um, probably um, politically 
small p uncommitted. <clears throat> but if there are good Christian socialists, three cheers for them. Um, there's no reason why anyone shouldn't be. Um, does the disconnect or does it matter? No, I don't think so. Um, let clergy have their political beliefs. Um, and um, uh, uh, vive la difference, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, spe I suppose I, I'm not too worried either of the fact that it, whatever the political label is, I suppose I'm just, um, to me, it strikes, it strikes me as, as odd that there seems to be a, a disparity there um, between clergy and laity seems to be kind of these sort of two um, not homogenous groups, but moving in slightly different directions. But yes, I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, as you say that um, this. You know, I listen to an awful lot of sermons, uh, and I very, very rarely am able to detect in them a um, political note of commitment to a political party. And I hope no one ever hears that in my sermons. Um, but uh, I, I just don't think. It's the business of the clergy to be talking party politics at all. Right. In fact, they should shy away from it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that resonates with what you said at the beginning about an interest in in, in the deeper issues that transcend, uh, that transcend party yeah. politics. Um, I know that you've um, we've participated in and, and supported uh, organisations like Christians in Parliament, so this cross-party uh, group for Christians working in Parliament. What do you think is the climate just now for for, for Christians in, in in politics? Is it a positive one, ambivalent, negative uh, in the in the UK specifically? I think that um, <clears throat> Christians in Parliament, uh, with whom I have very little to do, although I've spoken there once or twice, okay. um, it, it's a very good uh, organisation because it. Uh, enables Christian speakers and uh, faith issues to be heard by quite a wide spectrum of not only parliamentarians, but also one forgets that the Palace of Westminster is like a small town, or not so small town, there are certain something like 10, 12,000 people with parliamentary passes as researchers, as staffers, and any organisation which brings um, uh, you know, the gospel in any form um, and debates on faith issues uh, gives them a platform, I think is to be applauded. I'm actually very proud of being honorary chaplain to a fairly new ministry, at least as far as chaplaincy is concerned, called Christians in Government. And this is, in fact, for civil servants. Um, it's been going for some considerable time, but it's never had a chaplain before. And um, I love the work I do with Christians in government. And I attend regular prayer meetings in various government departments, either virtually or in the flesh. I also give talks. And there is a, a, a good tradition in the civil service of certainly non-political, because the civil service are automatically very well non-political, but there's a big, and growing interest and hunger uh, in the Christian teachings inside the government as personified by civil servants. And I hope that's true of the government as personified by elected politicians. Well, that's encouraging. That's encouraging to hear, yeah. Um, I think just to draw, the, draw our conversation to a close, uh, looking at the time, um, so my concluding question generally looks at the public conversations that we have around politics as Christians. And I know, I know that you've been keen to, um, to, to transcend party politics. Um, nevertheless, I just wondered, my, my sort of final question is twofold in nature, looking at um, the relationship between um, sort of political philosophy or political values that might transcend party politics and the relation that relationship of that to Christian faith. I just wondered if you if you might be able to talk about what perhaps Christians can learn from your own 
political tradition, however you define that, and then what they can offer to that political tradition, perhaps as a corrective or as a way of speaking into that, uh, perhaps prophetically or um, correctively challenging it. When I arrived at Wycliffe Hall as a student, my first essay question I had to write um, by my tutor was, to what extent was Jesus of Nazareth a political figure? And it's a very good question because, although of course he was neither of any party politics, he was a political force. He made things happen. He wanted change in society. So I myself think, I mean, I, in a very feeble way, try and uh, always learn from the example and model of Jesus. He was not afraid to speak out, to speak truth to power, to uh, take on the establishment of the day. And I think to that extent, um, Christian voices should be small p, not party uh, voices. And the more um, Christians get involved in civic life, in uh, the whole arena of uh, the public square, in my view, the better. Uh, I go back to that quotation of Burke I used right at the very beginning. If anyone says to me, the state should be given up as lost, he himself really should be given up. Um, Burke would be rather better, but that's the thought. Everyone's got a duty to engage, and Christians have a duty to engage in the issues of the day from a viewpoint of the Christian faith. Uh, Christian faith and doesn't apply to things like axle weights on juggernaut lorries or something like that. But there are a great many issues of the day in which Christians should have and need to have uh, a strong voice. So I would encourage uh, anyone who has a Christian faith to not be afraid to use it uh, in a small p political way, just as Jesus of Nazareth was a political figure throughout his ministry. Mm. Thank you. I think that's a, a good a good note in which to end. Thanks so much for giving okay. it. Thanks very much. Thank you.